Okay, let me introduce the first speaker, who is a long-time friend and a laparoscopic surgeon in Malaysia and Asia as well. Dr. Selva, obstetrician and gynecologist and a specialist in reproductive medicine at the private hospital in Malacca, Malaysia. He heads the ONG unit and the IVF center at the hospital. Dr. Selva received his initial training in laparoscopy under the guidance of Professor Song Hui Yong. Now, Professor Song is the boss of Professor Lee Chi Long at Changken Memorial Hospital, Taipei in 1994. Dr. Selva is the pre past president of APH. He is the past president of ONG Society of Malaysia and currently chairs his endoscopy subcommittee and is involved in promoting gynecology, endoscopy surgery in Malaysia and in the region as well. A lot of people know Selva. He is a very learned guy and uh, has this energy to teach and learn. So without further ado, um, Silver's topic, you try and after my me and series section, I, I chose this lecture because it is the way uh, he gives a lecture and his treatment of the subject is quite different from what we have uh, uh, heard of so far. So Selva, over to you. Okay, firstly, let me thank uh, Dr. Lee and APH and ISMI for giving me this opportunity to speak on this topic. I actually spoke on this topic uh, two years ago during the RCOG meeting in uh, Singapore. So um, what I'm going to speak is myomectomy and risk of uterine rupture in pregnancy, a review of the evidence between laparoscopic and abdominal approach. Of course, I'll touch on uh, caesarean section as well. Uh, I think Dr. Uh, Professor Bernard Chen and... Um, and Dr. Bay has touched about this topic uh, in two weeks ago, so I may overlap with what they have uh, given, they have spoken, but I will concentrate on just you try and rupture in this lecture. So um, I, I approach this uh, topic with uh, about seven questions. Uh, these are the questions that people usually ask. First is, what is the difference between performing myomectomy laparoscopically compared to abdominally? The second question is, what is the risk of uterine rupture during pregnancy in general? The third question is, is the incidence of uterine rupture in pregnancy higher with laparoscopic myomectomy compared to abdominal myomectomy? Fourthly, what is the risk factors causing uterine rupture in pregnancy after myomectomy? Fifth is, can we prevent uterine rupture in pregnancy after performing myomectomy? And uh, Lastly, how long after myomectomy, laparoscopic or abdominal, is pregnancy safe? I think these are the common questions, and I'll try to look at the literature and answer these questions. Now, the first question is, uh, what is the difference between performing myomectomy laparoscopically compared to abdominally? Now, the classic uh, surgical technique used for abdominal myomectomy was described by Berkeley and Bonnie in 1911, and they used a scalpel to make the uterine incision the suture ligation of bleeding vessels in the myometrium and interrupted mattress silk sutures to obliterate dead space in the myometrium and achieve wound closure. I think all of us who are watching this have done this surgery. I just want to remind you all, just to show you all that uh, we all do this surgery, maybe slightly differently from others. I don't use a scalpel, but I use uh, quite a bit of, a little bit of uh, diatomy to try and shell out all these fibroids. And this is what I'm doing. I'm not teaching you all how to do open myomectomy, but just to remind us uh, how we do open myomectomy as compared to laparoscopic myomectomy. And what are the difference in these techniques so that we will uh, then look at uh, what is the difference in things like wound healing between an open myomectomy and a laparoscopic myomectomy. And here, this, this patient had multiple fibroids and she's subfertility. So I decided that this surgery should be done open. And so all these fibroids are removed. There are all, all, altogether about 30 fibroids in there. So the next question is, how is laparoscopic myomectomy performed? Now, basically what we do is we, uh, the first laparoscopic myomectomy was described by Kurt Sam in 1979. More electrocautery is used to cut the uterus and coagulate the bleeders. And suturing is one layer instead of multiple layer of shoe suturing. This is when we first started. And probably now we are all doing more multiple layer suturing. And uh, this is a surgery that I just uh, did some years ago. And so these are just a single, uh, probably type uh, three fibroid. 
Uh, and uh, so the cavity was entered during this surgery. And uh, so the suturing is done. First layer is to take part of the, uh, the, endo uh, the, the endometrium and closing it uh, using a 2O polyglactin suture. And uh, so this, is, this, this surgery is done suturing in multiple layers. So the first layer is closed. And then a second layer is usually done to close this first layer, to cover this first layer. And generally, I use a polyglactin one suture, a stronger suture for this. And uh, people do diff uh, in single layer, multiple layers. So I usually prefer, uh, prefer to do it multiple layer, just exactly how I will do it in, a, in an open surgery. So this is being done. And as you see, at this time, I was not using barb suture. This is a traditional uh, suturing technique. And uh, so the second layer is then closed. And then next layer will be the serosal layer. We can close the serosal layer in many lay many ways. We can use figure of eight interrupted sutures. We can use continuous uh, locked sutures. But here, uh, or figure, uh, or call, um, uh, or what they call as uh, inverted sutures. And here, I'm I'm doing a subcuticular suturing to make it look nice, and the suture doesn't actually uh, is revealed outside. So this is subcuticular suturing of this uh, serosal layer. So we do this surgery in different methods, but the aim of course is to obliterate any uh, dead space and to oppose the serosa so that wound healing will be good. So this is uh, the end of the surgery. And usually we put in some anti-additions just to prevent adhesion. So this is how laparoscopic myomectomy is done. I, I show these two video to look at the evidence. So what is the how do when we compare these uh, two surgeries, these two types of surgeries, myomectomy and hysterectomy? How do we how do we do it? Okay, let me just move this down. So this is a this is a study that comparison of intramural myomectomy scar after laparotomy or laparoscopy. Now, okay, the uterine scars were tested in abdominal and laparoscopic myomectomy. They were examined at subsequent cesarean section by this study, which is an old study done in 2004. And after abdominal myomectomy, the scar were similar thickness to the normal myometrium. In contrast, the scars after laparoscopic myomectomy are strained, had poor defined ages, and were more contracted and thinner than normal myometrium. This is based on this study. And the authors concluded that these differences were likely due to the use of sutures to achieve hemostasis during an abdominal myomectomy, whereas bipolar coagulation was used during laparoscopic myomectomy. As I said, this is a study that was done in 2004 when suturing skills were not that great. I think it would be much better if the study is done now, probably similar. So the resultant thermal damage to the myometrium induces proliferation of connective tissue, which cannot remodel during pregnancy. So that may be the reason why they saw the differences. So that's how the difference between performing uh, laparoscopy, myomectomy, laparoscopically and abdominally. So the next question to ask is, what is the risk of uterine rupture during pregnancy in general? So what is the prevalence of uterine rupture? So in an unselected pregnant woman in a community-based study, this is for cesarean section, the, the, the uh, rate of uterine rupture is, is uh, calculated to be between 0.02 to 0.30% with a median of 0.05%. If, if we do unselected pregnant women in a hospital-based study, the rate of uterine rupture during uh, pregnancy after is, is 0 0.01 to 2.90 with a median of 0.31%. This is for cesarean section. And in women with a history of previous cesarean section, the rate is about 1%. So, so this, is, this, is the, uh, this is what we are comparing with when we, do it, when we are doing a, a, a myomectomies. So the next question is, is the incidence of uterine rupture in pregnancy higher with laparoscopic myomectomy compared to abdominal myomectomy? This is the question commonly asked. Now, there are many case reports on uterine rupture after laparoscopic myomectomy. Here you can see uh, these case reports that starts with uh, in 1995 and then goes down to quite recent 2004, 2002. And here are more recent reports. Here's a report of seven uterine rupture uh, cases after laparoscopic myomectomy, an update of the literature. Uterine rupture after laparoscopic myomectomy, two cases. Here, uterine rupture after laparoscopic myomectomy for removal of a pedunculated myoma. 
and spontaneous uterine rupture at 27 weeks of pregnancy after laparoscopic myomectomy. So someone actually grouped this, all this together and did a, a, a meta-analysis. And I will just review this meta-analysis to, un to answer that question, whether the uterine rupture is, what is the rate of uterine rupture after a laparoscopic myomectomy and, and uh, open myomectomy? So this is the result. It's a very complicated uh, result here. And what I'll do is I'll break the reports down for you all. Okay, so the first uh, result is that within this 3,685 pregnancy, there were 29 cases of uterine rupture, a reported re uh, result of 0.79%, uh, one during labor and 28 prior to onset of labor. So there was a trend for an increased occurrence of uterine rupture following laparoscopic myomectomy. There were 24 events out of the, uh, out, uh, out of the uh, total amount, which is 1.2% versus three events in, in, in 705 cases, that is 0.4%. But the, stat the differences were not found to be statistically uh, significant. There was one case of uterine rupture after hysteroscopic myomectomy. One case of uterine rupture during labor, but the mode of myomectomy was not known. And uh, of the 28 ruptures occurred during pregnancies between 17 and 48, 40 weeks of, pregnancy, of gestation, 80% of the ruptures occurred between 28 and 36 weeks of pregnancy. So continuing on, out of the 400 women who attempted vaginal birth after laparoscopic myomectomy, a large majority, that is 373 women or 93% eventually experienced a successful vaginal delivery, while only 7% uh, were delivered by cesarean section. Out of the 124 women who attempted vaginal delivery after a myomectomy by an open approach, 109 or 88% delivered by vaginal, uh, by vaginally compared to 15 or 12% who needed to be delivered by uh, secondary caesarean section. So there was no significant difference for the risk of secondary caesarean section after a laparoscopic compared to an open myomectomy. So if a patient has undergone laparoscopic myomectomy or open myomectomy, if you have decided for the patient to have a vaginal delivery, their success rate for, attempt, uh, for achieving a spontaneous vaginal delivery is about the same. Now, just over 50% of the fibroids removed uh, that lead to uterine rupture, the uterine wall and subsequent pregnancy were localized in the intramural part of the womb, which is 54%. The median size of the fibroid was five centimeters. And the study, they found no clear correlation between the risk for uterine rupture and location of the fibroid and the suturing technique, whether the operations were done in the universities or, no, or in a non-university hospital. So there were eight neonatal deaths uh, following the uterine rupture, five for laparoscopy and three for open surgery, and there were no maternal deaths. So in the discussion, what they said is that the prevalence of uterine rupture following myomectomy, all types of surgery, was 0.79%, which is comparable to after caesarean section, which is about 1%. There's no significant difference between the incidence of rupture during pregnancy following laparoscopic, which is 1.2% versus open, which is 0.4%. And a higher primary caesarean section rate after laparoscopic than open myomectomy. So most, pe most people, many people who do laparoscopic myomectomy just decide to do an elective caesarean section as opposed to open myomectomy because probably fear of litigation probably, but if they allow them to go into vaginal delivery, their success rate is the same. So as you can see here, uterine rupture in women following myomectomy almost exclusively occurs during pregnancy and very exceptionally during active labor as opposed to prior caesarean section. We all know that the uterine rupture in caesarean section, prior caesarean section occurs during labor as opposed to myomectomy. And this is explained because of the site of the surgery as in most myomectomies, the surgery is done on the body of the womb, which is the corporal part of the womb, as opposed to the lower segment in the case of a caesarean delivery. There is also no significant increase in risk of secondary caesarean section after laparoscopy compared to open. Attempts at vaginal birth seems equally highly successful following laparoscopy or an open myomectomy. So there's only one case of uterine rupture that occurred during labor, but the details of that myomectomy was not known. It was believed that there was a high dose of oxytocin used in that particular case. 
Only a small number of uterine ruptures indicate no clear evidence on location and size of fibroid that lead to uterine rupture. So this I will come to in a little while. And there's no relationship between use of suturing technique and uterine rupture. So most uterine rupture, as, as I said earlier, occurred in the mid trimester of pregnancy. So, so you can see that uh, to answer the question, is the incidence of uterine rupture in pregnancy higher with laparoscopic myomectomy compared to abdominal myomectomy? It appears that there is a tendency towards higher, but it was not statistically significant. So let's look at the next question. What is the risk factor causing uterine rupture in pregnancy after myomectomy? So this is a paper that looked at this question risk factors for uterine rupture after laparoscopic myomectomy. And they reviewed 19 cases of uterine rupture after laparoscopic myomectomy. They studied these cases in detail and they found that the myoma was removed and it ranged from one to 11 centimeters. The mean is 4.5 centimeters. One woman had two small myoma removed both 1.2 centimeters. All other women had only one myoma that was removed. And 13 procedures, the uterine incision were made using monopolar exposure. Two surgeons had bipolar scissors, one used cold scissors, and one used ultrasonic scissors. And in five cases, the endometrial cavity was entered. This is important, okay? Out of the 19 cases of uh, uterine rupture, only five cases had the uterine cavity, endometrial cavity entered. And hemostasis was done using monopolar electrosurgery in six cases, bipolar in seven, bipolar and suture in three, and sutures alone in two. So the uterine defects were closed with only in one, one suture in three women, one layer of sutures in three, in four women. One woman had only the cirrhosa that was closed and uterine defects were not closed in three cases and multi-layer closure was done in only three cases. So what did they conclude from this study? They said that we should use limited use of electrosurgery and multi-layer closure of myometrium except in superficial uterine defects. And the effects of the carbon dioxide pneumoproteinum on the wound healing and an understanding of the individual healing characteristic related to the production of growth factors or express collagen disposition is also necessary. So this is something that has not been resolved yet, whether carbon dioxide pneumoperitoneum actually affects wound healing. And even in ideal surgical technique, individual wound healing characteristics may predispose to the in uterine rupture. So we, we don't know what is the ideal surgical technique. So now I've looked at the risk factors causing uterine rupture. And what you can see is that we cannot identify the exact risk factors. Uh, some people say that if you enter the uterine cavity, you get higher uterine rupture, but that is not shown in this particular study. So the next question is, can we prevent uterine rupture in pregnancy after performing myomectomy? Now, there is no studies that looked at this and I don't think anybody knows how to prevent uterine rupture in pregnancy after performing myomectomy. The general consensus is if you don't enter the uterine cavity, you will have less uterine rupture. That was been disproved by this particular study that I showed earlier. Perhaps uh, by shrinking the fibroids using HIFU may be one way of preventing uterine rupture. And probably all our experts will be discussing about that in a little while. The last question I would like to ask is, how long after a myomectomy, laparoscopic or abdomen is pregnancy safe? This is a favorite question. Everybody asks this question and I try to look at the literature to answer this question. So this is the first uh, paper, which is a post myomectomy sonographic imaging, uterus re remodeling and scar repair. This paper was published in 2009. And here they did an ultrasound evaluation of the abdominal myomectomy scar performed 60 to 90 days after surgery. And they found mixed echogenic areas thought to be the result of hyperplastic myometrium, small hematoma and suture material. And there was a gradual shrinkage of the myometrium, resolution of the hematomas and absorption of the suture materials led to a decrease in size of the scar over three months. So this particular paper says that probably three months is the time when the scar will completely heal. This is another study, MRI evaluation of the uterine structure after myomectomy 
published in 2006, said using MRI, they look at the uterine structure after a myomectomy, and they found that the uterine healing process was complete in 12 weeks after abdominal myomectomy in the absence of hematoma or edema formation in the myometrium. This is the last paper, Evaluation of Post-Myomectomy Uterine Scar, and this is published in 2005. In this study, they use ultrasound, uh, a preoperative myoma greater than 10 centimeter, and experience of the surgeon was significantly correlated with the formation of uterine, uterine scar hematoma. So this is what we are trying to prevent uterine scar hematomas causing weakening of the scar. And if the uterus, the fibra is bigger than 10 centimeters and uh, an experienced surgeon will probably have a lesser chances of having a uterine scar hematoma. And so they also com concluded that you, wound healing seemed to be complete within three months. So to answer that question, three months seems to be uh, 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 a figure that seemed to uh, be the figure to say that the uterine wound is uh, completely healed. But I think many people will add another three months and say probably six months will be a safe time. So uh, in conclusion, I have looked at six questions. The first question is, what is the difference between performing myomectomy laparoscopically compared to abdominally? You noted that the way we do the myomectomy probably previously is different from now. We are doing our laparoscopic myomectomy more similar to that of open myomectomy by using suturing with less uh, usage or usage of uh, diatomy. And so the wound should heal about the same as that of the open myomectomy. The risk factor of uterine pregnancy, uh, uterine rupture during pregnancy is about 1%. The incidence of uterine rupture in pregnancy is higher during laparoscopic myomectomy compared to abdominal myomectomy, although this is, uh, this is not true by, by the studies, although it has a tendency to be higher with 1.2% with laparoscopic myomectomy and 0.4% with abdominal myomectomy. We looked at the risk factors. Out of the 19 patients, the, they noted that the risk factors, they couldn't find anything that pinpoints uh, uh, something as a risk factor for uterine rupture, even entering the uterine cavity. There's nothing that we can do to prevent the uterine rupture and how long is, uh, is the duration for allowing pregnancy is more, probably more than three months, probably six months. Thank you.